tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Consider them dangerous. Do not approach. Take no action and call immediately 911. Two missing teens now suspects in the deaths of three people in northern BC. Also, the deaths of two kids that leads to a lawsuit against Vancouver businessman Luigi Aquilini and we're disappointed in the decision. The Vancouver Public Library banned from participating in this year's Pride Parade. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. We begin tonight with a shocking twist in the deaths of three people in northern BC. Two missing teenagers from Port Alberni now considered suspects in all three killings. Investigators have also been able to confirm that Cam McLeod and Briar Schmigelski have left British Columbia. McLeod and Schmigelski are wanted in connection with the killings of Australian Lucas Fowler and his American girlfriend China Dees, as well as a third unidentified man. The investigation spanning multiple cities in BC and Canada. Here you can see Mounties combing through the suspect's burned out vehicle near Dees Lake. They are searching for evidence. Let's go live now to our Tina Lovegreen from RCMP headquarters. Tina. Anita, RCMP are holding information closely, worried that by releasing too many details, they'll jeopardize their investigation. But police believe that the two are making their way east and are on the move. They were last seen in Saskatchewan in a 2011 Toyota Art RAV4. And then they were spotted in Manitoba in a town called Gillam. That's about an 11 hour drive north from Winnipeg near Hudson Bay. Consider them dangerous. Do not approach. Take no action and call immediately. 911. Lifelong friends, now murder suspects. These photos of 19 year old Cam McLeod and 18 year old Briar Schmigelski taken more than 24 hours ago in northern Saskatchewan. They could have changed their appearance or attempted to change their appearance. They could be wearing different clothing. They could be driving a different vehicle. Police believe the pair are on the move. We don't know exactly what they may, what, you know, what they may be carrying or what, what the, even what their thoughts are. The teens were originally considered missing, now the subjects of a Canada-wide manhunt, wanted in connection with the double murder of Australian Lucas Fowler and his American girlfriend, China Dees. This can't happen to another family, and I mean, it shouldn't have happened to ours. Dees's mother pleading for anyone to come forward with information. Every evening, it's late in the evening, and I'm trying to lay down with a new image, a, a new surveillance, a new theory or something like that and it's really hard, it's getting worse. Four days after the couple's bodies were discovered along the remote Alaska highway, the suspect's truck was found torched near Dees Lake and another unidentified body found nearby. A man in his 50s or 60s, police are hoping this sketch will help identify him. Yeah, it's just crazy. Curtis Dewar, who worked with the men at the local Walmart, is shocked. I didn't know him well, but um, I know we all care about each other here, and it's not nothing we want to hear ever, and especially when, when you know you know the names and you've seen them when you're growing up. A lot of questions remain, but Mounties say they have to be careful about what they release. There are many people that we are yet to speak to that have key facts that could build upon the current evidence and information that we have. Any information that builds upon that impacts that changes somebody's memory or recollection would be a negative to, from an investigational standpoint. It's still not clear how the pair allegedly came into contact with all three victims and why. Anita, we heard from Briar Schmigalski's father. This was before they were um, suspects when they were missing. And he described the boys as good kids who enjoyed playing video games. We spoke to him again today. He said he was shocked and heartbroken. And no matter what the turnout, he has lost his only child. And this just in, we've heard from Fox Lake Creek Nation Chief Walter Spence, who says that they have discovered a vehicle burned and discarded near the reserve of Bird, but they don't know if they and they cannot say whether this is connected to this investigation. But again, I want to reiterate that the RCMP are warning people to stay away if they see these individuals, do not approach them, and to call 911 instead. Anita? And that reserve Tina's talking about is in Manitoba. Tina Lovegreen, live for us tonight. Thank you.
And in Dees Lake, investigators are searching for answers, trying to connect crime scenes and find a motive. Greg Rasmussen is on the ground and has more on how the community is coping. Four days after it was first spotted burning, police sift through the charred remains of the suspect's truck, bit by bit, piece by piece, searching for evidence in one of a series of murders. Up the highway, another crime scene. This is where the man's body was found. The markings on the ground indicate investigators were very interested in the tire tracks left behind. All along this highway, with vast distances between communities, people have been talking of the fear sparked by the crimes and worry about what might happen next. The suspects were spotted in Claudia Bunce's Jade store north of Dees Lake. I don't know how I feel. We've just heard the news that these boys that we were so concerned about um, are now suspects. So now we've gone from search and rescue and worrying that they were victims to now being suspects. I, I think it's going to take us some time to um, to be able to accept this. So how anxious have you been the last few days? Very. Chief Marie Kwok launched overnight patrols in her remote community of 300. Normally open doors and windows have been locked tight, but now? A lot of relief, like I was saying, like I just could feel the relief in my body and, you know, just knowing that we can get back to a somewhat normal life. I mean, I know it's going to take some time for everybody to recover and feel really okay. Many here embrace the remoteness and beauty of this area, but this week the isolation heightened the fear no cell phone service and the nearest RCMP detachment an hour away. CBC. Yeah, shift a little bit. News the suspects were believed to have left the area brought relief for this group of 26 university students cycling thousands of kilometers from Texas to Alaska. I mean, there's always that stereotype of Canada as uh, our friendly neighbor of the north and stuff, and so to come up here and uh, have to deal with like, the, the idea of just gruesome murders happening along these highways and stuff is definitely... Definitely a little shocking and stuff, but I mean, it's also out here in the wilderness. Although the hunt for the suspects has shifted, more possible crime scenes are being examined. This afternoon, police and searchers targeted a new area along the highway. With the fears of the last few days abating, many questions remain about this series of murders that are now believed linked, but are still in many ways inexplicable. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News. East Lake, BC. We have some breaking news to tell you about now. One person is in critical condition after a police incident involving a transit bus in Richmond this afternoon. Police and ambulance were on scene around 2 p.m. near Number 3 Road and Camby. The victim was transported to hospital. We will have more information on this at 11 o'clock. A lawsuit has been filed against the father of the owners of the Vancouver Canucks. As Jesse Johnston reports, it has to do with a fire on an Aquilini property that resulted in the deaths of two kids. It was July 31st, 2017, when a fire broke out at a manufactured home in Benton City, Washington, which is 32 kilometers east of Kennewick and about a three and a half hour drive from Seattle. Sergio Hernandez lived in the home with his wife, Erica, their seven year old daughter, Patty, and 10 year old son, Alex. The parents were both employees at Aquilini Red Mountain Vineyards. The mobile home was staff housing on site. The children were both asleep when the fire started at 7 a.m. The parents were already working nearby when smoke started billowing out of the home. Sergio broke through a window, got both children outside, and then managed to escape himself. But his children were both badly burned, and Sergio also had burns to about a third of his body. Patty, the daughter, died weeks later, and Alex, the son, succumbed to his injuries in late January of 2018. Lawyers for the Hernandez family allege there were no smoke alarms in the home, and extensive alterations were made to the electrical systems without required permits or inspections. It's also alleged the boy and girl both endured horrific suffering before their deaths, and their father hasn't worked since. None of the allegations have been proven in court, and the Aquilini family has not yet filed a statement of defense. The Aquilini family did, however, release a statement. It says, quote, 
We deeply mourn the loss of these two young lives and the resultant burn injuries to Sergio when he and other employees tried to rescue the children. The Aquilinis go on to say they provided moral and financial support to the parents and relatives for eight months. The Aquilinis also allege the fire started minutes after Sergio Hernandez hit a junction box with his truck. A lawyer for the Hernandez family acknowledges he's heard about an incident involving a truck striking the box, but he says, however, whether that has anything to do with what happened will have to be investigated as part of the lawsuit. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, the Vancouver Public Library has been barred from participating in this year's Pride Parade. The CBC's Dan Burrett is live outside the main library branch here in downtown Vancouver. Dan, why is the library out of the parade? Anita, it's over a talk. The Pride Society claims that the library allowed, in its words, transphobic and anti-sex worker speaker Megan Murphy to book a space for a January event here at the main branch. And Pride claims that during that event, five speakers asserted that trans women are not women and should not be treated as women. It argues conduct reflected at that event and past statements essentially violate the BC Human Rights Code. Here's Pride. Megan Murphy uh, has outed people, has dead named people, has harassed people um, and her followers as well. And so allowing that platform for that to happen is really damaging to the trust um, that was built between the Vancouver Public Library and the trans community. Um, so this room rental policy, um, if, if it stays the same way, speakers like this will continue to be allowed um, their platform for hate speech and discriminatory speech at the Vancouver Public Library, thus making it not safe for the trans community to, to be there. And Dan, what is the Pride, or the library rather, saying about all of this? Anita, though, the library said in response it did seek legal advice before and after that January event and found it was not in violation of the BC Human Rights Code. Have a listen. As a public institution, we're bound by Canadian law and the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms includes the right to freedom of expression. So it, for us as an institution, freedom of expression is also a core value and that is something that we need to uphold. So we do feel this is a decision that needs to be made by the legal system. It is a very important issue and that means that when the BC Human Rights Commissioner comes into office at the beginning of September, the library will ask the BC Human Rights Commissioner to consider this issue specifically. Now, Pride says individual library workers who work here are welcome to march in the Pride Parade with the city or with their union, but the library itself is out. And, Anita, worth noting, the Pride Society recently made a decision to bar the University of British Columbia for taking part in the parade after the school allowed transgender rights activist Jen Smith to host an event on campus in June criticizing BC's sexual orientation and gender identity curriculum, that known as SOGI. Anita? Dan Burt, live for us tonight outside the Vancouver Public Library. Thank you. A human rights complaint against a Denny's restaurant in Vancouver has been settled. It comes almost two years after an Indigenous couple says they were victims of racial profiling. Elena Moses and Shane Hummel filed a complaint with the BC Human Rights Tribunal after they say they were asked to pay before eating. They claim they were targeted because of their race case was scheduled for a tribunal hearing last month, but both parties have now agreed to settle. The settlement includes a written apology letter from Denny's and a commitment to provide anti-racism training to staff before the end of the year. A lawyer on the case will not disclose whether a monetary compensation was included. Burnaby RCMP are hoping a sketch will help catch a man accused of voyeurism. On March 25th, a woman was in a Walmart change room when she alleges she saw a cell phone under the door. Upon exiting the stall, she says she noticed the suspect come out of the change room next to her. Police say the man was confronted by other shoppers but left the scene. He's described as Asian with a slender build and around five feet tall. He has salt and pepper hair and wears glasses. Anyone with information is asked to contact police. The Transportation Safety Board is calling for better safety standards at train crossings after a man in a wheelchair was hit and killed in Chilliwack last year. The deadly incident happened in May of 2018. 
Investigators say the rear wheels of the man's wheelchair got caught in the gap between the rail and the sidewalk while he was crossing the tracks. With the train quickly approaching, two bystanders struggled frantically to free the man. They weren't able to, and in the end, he was hit by the train. The man died, and one of the bystanders was seriously hurt. Transport Canada found several safety concerns with the crossing and issued notices of non-compliance to CN Rail and the city of Chilliwack. The city has scheduled improvements to the crossing to be finished this summer. Well, BC hotel workers are alleging harassment by clients in the workplace. They held a protest today in downtown Vancouver, and as Leanne Young reports, they're demanding more safety measures. And a warning, some might find these details disturbing. Sorry guys, I'm shaking. Casey Vanderveen struggles to find the words, but she wants the public to know what she's faced as a hotel restaurant server. I have been solicited for sex, for tips, endured lewd comments, been physically restrained and sexually assaulted. She's one of more than 10 women coming forward from Vancouver's hotel industry, alleging sexual harassment while on the job, each with their own sordid tale. He offered me $1,000 to give him a massage. I was shocked. Then there's Elaine Demasana. She was called up to clean a room. She knocked three times. No one answered, so she went in. But the guest was there, lying down on the bed and masturbating, looking at me straight in my eyes. So that's where I realized really that he planned this and he intended to do this. Stories like that prompted Zayuda Chan into action. I was very upset um, because as a president of the hospitality union, a lot of our members are women. 56% to be exact. She says most of the women who have come forward are from the Hotel Rosewood, Georgia, where workers say wealthy clients are left with the impression they're allowed to do what they want. If you could describe Rosewood and Rosewood Hotel Georgia, in one word you could say service. And that's this public so display today has the hotel demanding an apology from the union, concerned about its reputation. In a statement it says, Rosewood Hotel Georgia maintains a zero-tolerance policy for sexual harassment. All past grievances have been resolved, with the exception of one grievance, which was received today and is currently being addressed. Two city councillors are putting forward a motion to help protect hotel workers with measures like mandatory training. There are a lot of these women are uh, vulnerable and are low wage, um, and so uh, so I find the stories hard to hear and also very motivating that we have a chance um, to, to really make their lives better and, and their work better. The union is hoping in the meantime hotels will implement panic buttons for workers to wear and promise that when women do step up to share their stories, they won't be penalized. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. A Vancouver park bench painted by a woman in memory of her dead partner will be able to stay in place until December. This comes a month after the city threatened to remove it. In a unanimous vote, the park board agreed to keep the bench for now. The park board asked staff to investigate other options for artistic enhancement to dedication benches. This would exclude paint or other coatings that could damage the wood. Staff are to report back by December, at which point the park board will make a final decision on the memorial bench. Um, I have mixed emotions. I'm definitely relieved that the bench will be remaining until December. Uh, in limiting the motion and, and not allowing the, any paint or coating, I believe that we're limiting the exploration of what the possibilities are. Goodkova's partner Colin McKay died in a motorcycle accident in July of 2015. She spent a week in June sanding, priming and painting his memorial bench in Kitsilano Beach Park. Kova is hopeful the bench will be allowed to stay past December. Well, today, TransLink unveiling new rapid bus service coming to Metro Vancouver, and it promises to cut commutes by 20%. The new service will cover five popular routes, including parts of the 99B line. The rapid buses will make fewer stops, include all door boarding and privileges like queue jumping at intersections. The new route is expected to move 12,000 customers an hour during rush hour, with the first buses hitting the streets in January.
Well, Brett, as you promised, another gorgeous day out there. Well, I love it when I can fulfill these promises. <laughs> I don't make them lightly. You have to keep that in mind, Anita. But right now, I am a bit surprised. It's definitely clouded over maybe a little bit more than I would have liked. However, this is probably a good indication that we may be seeing some light showers that I did mention a little bit earlier as the chance uh, for those showers later on tonight or if not tonight, first thing tomorrow morning. I will be getting to that, but right now I did want to just mention what our current temperatures are because all in all, it's still very pleasant outside. Still feels like an average summer night. We've got temperatures right around that 21 degree mark a little bit warmer down at the airport proper and if I show you what's going on on the radar right now you're going to notice that we don't really have any rain but you are going to see that cloud that's kind of just pushing in this is really going to be the trend for us here in the lower mainland over the next say couple of hours and probably through at least tomorrow morning so I wouldn't expect clear skies tonight but that said something I did want to mention that's a little bit more concerning we've had a lot of lightning into the Okanagan very recently in fact yesterday they estimate that about a thousand lightning strikes Environment Canada estimates that is a thousand lightning strikes was in the region and that ignited close to 10 new fires across the province and we've been seeing this right now in real time and on the note of other things like that we need to be worrying about far to the northeast in fact we have severe thunderstorm watches and a warning right now in effect and again similar reason we have a lot of lightning up into that region so this is something I'm going to be keeping a close eye on but down here it's just going to be a few light showers and then we're looking at a fairly dry remainder of the week okay thanks Brett you're welcome well, the NBA championship trophy made its way to Vancouver today, giving fans a chance to take in the historic Raptors win all over again. A BC native, the Toronto Raptors assistant coach, brought the Larry O'Brien trophy to the BC Sports Hall of Fame. Tradition dictates that players and staff on the winning team all get a day with the trophy. Now, he spent the morning signing autographs and posing for photos with fans. He joined the Raptors in 2011 after 11 seasons and five championships with the LA Lakers. A deal has been reached in Calgary to replace the 36-year-old Saddle Dome. Let's get to the chase. This is a good deal for Calgary. We worked hard to understand each other's position, and uh, I think we found a, a way to help build, in a fair and equitable way, to help build our, our city. The city and the owners of the Calgary Flames have agreed to a 50-50 split on the cost of a new $550 million hockey arena. If the deal goes through, construction will begin on the 19,000-seat facility in 2021. Calgary City Council votes on the proposal this coming Monday. Now for more on today's top story and the search for suspects in three B.C. murders in northern B.C., you can visit our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Our coverage is available for you to stream live and on demand anytime with our free mobile app, CBC Gem. You can also follow CBC Vancouver and uh, on Facebook and YouTube, as well as Instagram. The new spirit of can do. A new prime minister for the UK. A former London mayor takes over on Wednesday. That's tomorrow. So what's he promising coming up? Well, it's been a pretty delightful summer so far, and for many of us, that means time in or on the water. But the Life-Saving Society of Canada is reminding everyone to stay safe. That's because, as Deborah Goebel explains, most water-related fatalities are preventable. On the hottest day of the year so far, the ocean can look pretty tempting at Kitts Beach as little kids take their first tentative steps. Parents hover above. Hold on to them all the time. Hold on because no matter how inviting the water, it can also be dangerous. It takes five seconds to drown. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, that, that's heartbreaking. Three and a half year old Hugh has his noodle, but when it comes to the beach, his parents take no chances. We take him swimming a lot and we just keep him within arm's reach and we don't, we don't take our eyes off him. According to the Life Saving Society, there were 50 unintentional water-related fatalities in BC in 2017, 283 across the country. All parents, you know, care about their children, right? And so they want to be responsible, right? But I think oftentimes we're viewed as, uh, as babysitters, when in reality, if I'm focusing all my attention on one child because their parent isn't paying attention, I can't watch the other, you know, 200 people in the water I need to be watching. One of the biggest problems in recent years is cell phones. It only takes a second to lose track of your child on a beach or in a pool. When children are drowning, most commonly, they 
kind of look to an adult because that's what they usually do. So they might be just completely submerged and just staring at um, adults or lifeguards. And you know, that's one of the most quiet ones when a children drown. And coming out of the water. But it's not just young children who need to exercise caution. Anybody could get into trouble in the water. Like I would never ever go out in the water on my own. These are elite swimmers, fast and experienced. Many, like Jeanette Purdom, are triathletes. Still, she says she's seen the best of the best suffer life-threatening leg cramps in the water. I could swim for 4K, but I still would never, ever get cocky. It's the ocean. You never, ever know there's currents. The weather can change in a moment. The highest frequency occurs among 20 to 24-year-olds. Males continue to have a much higher rate than females. Eight out of 10 drowning victims are male. And boaters add to the statistics. An average of 111 people in Canada die every year in either powered or non-powered boating. But the first thing you'll see with most people, they don't have life jackets. They're not wearing them. Oh, like a little shirt? Life jackets are life savers. Almost three quarters of drowning deaths happen in natural bodies of water. Less than 1% happen in lifeguard supervised settings. But it doesn't matter where it happens. Almost all are preventable. Deborah Goebel, CBC News, Vancouver. Some good lessons for sure. Stay with us and we will have more on big political news out of the UK and the US in just a few moments. Mayor of London Boris Johnson will be the UK's next Prime Minister, replacing Theresa May. Johnson to lead the UK out of the European Union by Halloween, he says. As Susan Ormiston reports, it's a promise that has taken down two of his predecessors. That Boris Johnson is elected as the leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party. Dull he is not. And for all his foibles, Boris Johnson brings unbridled optimism to a beleaguered country. We are once again going to believe in ourselves and what we can achieve. And like some slumbering giant, we are going to rise and ping off the guy ropes of self-doubt. He has won over Britain's Conservative Party, but not the country. Among the protesters who ring the convention centre today, some vigorous critics. What do you think of Boris Johnson as a PM? I think he's a clown. I think he's an absolute clown. I like it. It's brilliant. Britain's governing party has taken a bold, perhaps last chance gamble to stay in power. In 18 years in public life, nearly half as London's mayor, Boris Johnson has been a colourful if shambolic politician, yes, you got a driving the campaign to leave the European Union, inflating the perils of continued membership. E for energize. Now, it is his job to solve the impasse, deal or not. We're going to get Brexit done on October the 31st. We're going to take advantage of all the opportunities that it will bring in a new spirit of can do. But it is a colossal challenge, with a razor-thin majority in Parliament and a deeply divided party. Johnson was chosen as an antidote to Theresa May, but he will need a magician's skill, says Harry Mount, who worked with him as a journalist for years. He is fundamentally unpredictable. Something could go very badly wrong. I'd have thought anybody would find it very difficult to get through the almost impossible setup of Brexit. But there is this little bit of magic in Boris, which it's unlikely, but he could pull it off. And from the man who raised Boris Johnson, well, steady on. He does have a penchant for saying what he thinks. Oh, I think that's all right. I think, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't clamp that. You shouldn't squash that out totally. Tomorrow, watch this door. Theresa May will be moving out and Boris Johnson moving in each after meeting the Queen. He's already changing the tone. After a meeting of MPs this afternoon, one emerged to say, Boris love-bombed us. Snap polling, though, suggests nearly half of Brits are not so charmed. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, London. In the United States, a moment Republicans and Democrats alike have been waiting for. Robert Mueller is uh, finally set to testify before two U.S. House committees. Paul Hunter has more. 
Set for this room tomorrow, what's it gonna be? The Mueller movie, as some have dubbed it, a blockbuster or a dud? The Russian witch hunt. In Washington today, as he has so often, Donald Trump predicted the bottom line. No collusion. They have no collusion. The report of the so-called Russia investigation by former special counsel Robert Mueller is available for anyone to read all 448 pages of it, albeit with redactions. It found insufficient evidence the Trump campaign colluded with Russia on election meddling in 2016. But as Mueller himself has underlined, it doesn't clear Trump of obstructing justice. On Capitol Hill tomorrow, lawmakers, knowing most Americans haven't read the report, want to dive into its details with Mueller taking questions under oath. But he's long insisted the report should speak for itself, a view shared by the Justice Department, which in a letter yesterday pressed Mueller to, in effect, limit what he says. Today, Republicans downplayed expectations. I've heard all I need to hear from Mueller. I've read his report. I accept the findings. I don't think it's going to change public opinion. Or will it? Democrats seem to be betting even if Mueller simply reads aloud parts of his report, it'll reignite questions on Trump's behavior as president as the 2020 election draws ever closer. We want to get these facts out so the American people know what we're dealing with and hear it from Mueller himself. Um, rather than the lies that are coming from the president. So the big question, what will Mueller say? This is his chance to clarify anything he's seen, heard, or learned in all of this. Donald Trump will be in the White House tomorrow. He said he might watch some of it. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Two young men, once missing, now suspects in three northern BC killings. A pair from Port Alberni spotted fleeing across Canada. We'll have the latest and take you to their hometown coming up.
For four days, they had been described as missing. Their truck abandoned and burned in a remote corner of northern BC. But today, a stunning announcement. Two young Port Alberni men are now suspects in three deaths. And as Renee Filipponi reports, the subjects of a manhunt that so far has spanned four provinces. Cam and Breyer are no longer considered missing. The RCMP investigation turned on its head. The search for two missing teens, now a national manhunt. The RCMP are now considering Cam McLeod and Briar Schmigelski as suspects. 19-year-old Cam McLeod and 18-year-old Briar Schmigelski are now moving fast, seen yesterday in Manitoba, and before that captured in these surveillance images in Saskatchewan at the time driving a 2011 Toyota RAV4. They could have changed their appearance or attempted to change their appearance. They could be wearing different clothing. They could be driving a different vehicle. Police warn people to stay away. We don't know exactly, you know, what they may be carrying or what, what the, even what their thoughts are. Australian Lucas Fowler and American China Dees were on a road trip when they were shot and killed sometime early last week. This video is some of the last images of them alive before their bodies were found near their van on remote Highway 37. Four days later, in nearly 500 kilometers away, another body was found. An unidentified man found two kilometers from a burning truck belonging to McLeod and Schmigelski. Police aren't saying what changed, only that new information came to light, including the recent sightings of the pair very much alive. This is a this is a fast-moving investigation, and uh, w is compounded by several factors, which include the vastness of the north, the individual, the fact that individuals have made some effort to to move out of jurisdictions. All those things contribute to our ability to quickly uh, identify additional information or additional facts. But for the victims' families, the wait is excruciating. I need for anyone with information to share that because this can't happen to another family. And, I mean, it shouldn't have happened to ours. RCMP have reached out to police right across the country and warned the public to call 911 immediately if they see the suspects. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. And of course, there's reaction in the suspect's hometown of Port Alberni and a growing number of questions about these two young men. Tanya Fletcher joins us live now from Port Alberni. Tanya, what are people there telling you tonight? Well, Anita, this is such a fluid, fast-moving and developing story, and it's really in quite stark contrast to one of the main towns at the center of all of this itself. Here in uh, downtown Port Alberni, it's, uh, we're down on the main drag here, right along the quay, and it's relatively quiet. You see very few people around, but those who are here certainly know what's being talked about. Many have questions, but at this point, very few of them have answers. Port Alberni is a picturesque city of about 20,000 people, just about smack dab in the middle of Vancouver Island. But none here ever thought that news would involve two of their own and are now murder suspects at the centre of a cross-country manhunt. It's a loss for words, really. I don't, I know how, um, how tight-knit our community is and it, it hurts to kind of have something like that happen to people from here. And uh, it's a scary, it's a scary thing. So I'm hoping we get the answers that we're looking for. Cam McLeod and Briar Schmigelski have been friends most of their lives. They went to elementary school together and loved ones say they've stayed close ever since. Recently, they worked together at Walmart. I didn't know him well, but um, I know we all care about each other here and it's not nothing we want to hear ever. And especially when, when you know you know the names and you've seen them when you're growing up and all that. So it's a, it's a hard thing for sure. It was only about 24 hours ago Briar Schmigelski's father made a plea to police to find his son. That's when he was considered a missing person, not a murder suspect. They're just kids on an adventure. Like, they're good boys. They're really good boys. They've been friends since elementary school. Now, we actually spoke with that dad again today. Our local affiliate here on Vancouver Island, Check TV, he actually went back to them to clarify some things. He says he's shocked and saddened to learn these latest developments that his son now is, in fact, a murder suspect. He says he's been in touch with his son. He usually texts every day, and he would see him every two weeks, except for recently, of course. And he said that however of this all ends, he's now lost his only child. He says if, in fact, they are responsible, he doesn't even know them at all. So lots of confusion and lots of broken hearts here in Port Alberni. Anita?
Indeed, Tanya Fletcher reporting live from Port Alberni on Vancouver Island. Thank you, Tanya. Well, at 6.40, a look out at uh, downtown Vancouver in the port. Some clouds and even the possibility of a little rain ahead, but long term, it's nothing but sun. How hot and for how long? Well, Brett's got the full weather next. At the top of their food chain, whales have only one predator, us. After centuries of hunting, pollution, climate change, and commercial boat traffic threaten to push species into extinction. Along the West Coast, dozens of gray whales have turned up dead this year. Kim Brunhuber met with federal officials in California with a new plan to protect populations that might actually be working. 300 meters above the Santa Barbara Channel. And we got an animal, I think, off to our left. We're on the lookout for the telltale spray of a whale spout. We definitely have a big blow below us. One humpback, two humpback. But this monthly flight over the Channel Islands Marine Sanctuary isn't just about spotting whales. Uh, that's actually one of the smaller container ships. Sean Hastings is searching for something else, something that makes the bus-sized mammals below us look like goldfish. We have the confluence of ships coming in from Asia and unfortunately, right through the feeding grounds of these blue fin and humpback whales. Along the west coast this year, whales have been dying in unusually high numbers. At least four were hit by ships. One solution, getting ships to slow down. When you reduce the speed of a ship down to 10 knots, you reduce the likelihood of a fatal strike by 50%. But just asking the companies to get their ships to go slower hasn't worked. So now federal officials on the California coast are actually paying them. Companies get a small stipend based on the distance their fleets travel at 10 knots or slower. Six years ago, only 17% of ships were slowing down. Now it's up to 45%. There is an OOCL Canada ship underway at 9.7 knots, which is good to see. Now, Canadian maritime authorities are watching closely to see if something similar might work on northern coasts. And it's only limited by budget right now in terms of the number of ships we can incentivize to slow down. Providing incentives to all ships in the protected waters would cost about $2 million a year, but with a budget only a tenth that size, they can only reach a sliver of the thousands of container ships that pass through these waters. The ship below us, for instance, is traveling almost twice the recommended speed. If a whale is hit, it's pretty guaranteed it will be killed uh, by that speed. 
By increasing awareness, authorities had hoped to eventually wean companies off the payments, but they admit it's still a challenge to get ships to slow down on maritime highways with no speed limits. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Oxnard, California. Here in the Pacific Northwest, there is growing concern over a pod of orcas. Join host Gloria Makarenko on CBC's British Columbia's newest original podcast, Killers, J-Pod on the Brink, as we go in-depth on what's causing their decline. Available now on our website and wherever you listen to your podcasts. Brett's here now, and Brett, I can see the clouds sort of rolling in. I know, it looks a little ominous rain. out there, right? But I was just telling, actually, right in the break there, I was actually wondering whether or not these showers are still going to actually happen for downtown. I have a little more confidence that they're probably going to be going more so into the Fraser Valley, so I wanted to show you that. But to start things off, I wanted to show you what it did look like earlier in the day when it was a little bit sunnier. It wasn't nearly as cloudy first thing in the morning. In fact, we got some two cool, brilliant flashes of light there. I don't know if you caught that, but it definitely caught my eye. Certainly a very beautiful way to start the day. A little bit humid as well. Some people complaining about that. I, for one, embrace it all, as you know. But nevertheless, I did want to mention, as I was talking about, just the slight chance for showers as we go into the overnight. This is not a lot, certainly by comparison to what we've seen earlier on in the month. In general, for the next few hours, we're looking at some widespread cloud cover all across the metro region. And when we go ahead for a couple of hours, you're going to see that right to around midnight, we're going to see a few spotty showers popping up anywhere just east of Abbotsford. Farther into the valley you go, the greater the confidence is that you might be seeing in a spotty shower. Into the overnight, we could get a few trace ones going right across the downtown core and in time for first thing in the morning it's going to be a little bit touch and go but really aside from that we're not looking at any significant rain down here on the south coast however it's a completely different story in two other portions of our province and I wanted to mention first and foremost we're going to be seeing a big wave of rain coming up to the north and central coast and as well for Haida Gwaii and there is going to be a little bit coming to the southeastern region of the province if you have any interest there but what I did really want to mention what is specifically unusual for this time of year is just how much rain is actually headed to the Peace region. So specifically, we're talking about Fort Nelson. On the legend here, you can see anytime we get into these gray colors, that's indicative that potentially up to 100 millimeters of rain could be falling, and this is over a 48-hour period. Now, this is actually fairly significant at this point in time to the point where Environment Canada has already issued a special weather statement for the region, and right now, I did some math. I was looking at it. That region would normally get about 80 millimeters of rain in an entire month of July, and they could potentially be seeing that in 48 hours so certainly flooding is a very real concern there and in addition to that it will be downing the fire danger rating at least somewhat and it is still remaining quite high all across the south but in general our five-day forecast coming up ahead is looking quite nice temperatures right into the mid-20s where they should be and aside from the very slightest risk of a shower on Friday night into Saturday I don't really think there's anything to be complaining about there so that's not too bad no, summer continues on I'll try not to complain about the Friday Thank you. That's Thing. kind. Thanks, Brad. <laughs> A terrifying scene north of Montreal. Two school buses collide. Both go up in flames. Dozens of children sent to hospital. We'll have the latest coming up.
I'm Amy Bell. And here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. What's killing the southern resident killer whale population? Gloria Makarenko dives deep in our new original podcast, Killers, J-Pod on the Brink. And your favorite summer tradition is back. Musical Nooners is back for its 10th year. So grab a lunch and a friend and enjoy free concerts weekdays at noon all summer long. For more on these events, check us out online, cbc.ca slash bc. We have an update for you now on that police situation in Richmond. RCMP say a 21-year-old man is in custody after an alleged stabbing on a transit bus. A 42-year-old man has been taken to hospital in critical condition. Police and ambulances were on scene around 2 p.m. near Number 3 Road and Camby. We'll have more on the situation on our 11 p.m. newscast. A close call this morning on a highway north of Montreal. As the CBC's Arian Zarin Koub says, two buses collided in a fiery crash, sending dozens of children to hospital. They were supposed to go on a field trip to Oka. Instead, many of the day campers on these buses ended up in a hospital with bumps and bruises. I me reposed. When the chauffeur stopped right Puis après, on a entendu un gros bang venant de derrière. On a senti une grosse bosse, puis tout le monde avait mal à la tête. Police say at around 10 o'clock this morning, there was a slowdown on the highway. The driver of the first bus was unable to stop and hit the car in front of him. The second bus then collided with the first and a fire broke out. Witness Luc Despatie says it all happened very quickly. On voyait les deux autobus qui brûlaient. La première complètement, la deuxième est enflammée à peu près vers la moitié. A spokesperson for the hospital says 69 people were treated for minor injuries. Most were children and a few adults, including camp counselors and bus drivers. The president of the bus company, André Soutière, says he's grateful everyone is safe. Good news with the children, uh, they have no uh, major injury. And I send uh, to the hospital all people, make sure you have uh, no major damage. The SQ is investigating the accident and says this is likely a case of distracted driving. Ariane Zarenkoub, CBC News, Montreal. Well, the federal government is requesting bids for a massive contract to replace its fleet of fighter jets, the aging CF-18s. But as the CBC's John Paul Tasker reports, don't expect to see the new planes in the sky anytime soon. More than 10 years after the previous Conservative government began the process of buying new fighter jets and four years after Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was elected promising to reform the actual procurement process for these fighter jets, the government has reached a major milestone today. They formally began the request for proposals process, which is government jargon for saying they're ready to accept bids. Bids from four major aerospace players, including Saab of Sweden, Airbus in the United Kingdom, and two major American players are also vying for the job to build 80 fire jets, including Lockheed Martin and Boeing. Boeing has the F-18 Super Hornet on offer, and Lockheed Martin has the F-35, which is currently used by the U.S. Armed Forces. Now, this process is to replace existing planes, the CF-18s, that have been in our skies since 1983. That's right, they're more than 30 years old, and they really need to be replaced for that Canada can meet its military requirements to NATO and to NORAD. So the process is now underway, but they will not actually select a plane to build until 2020. The federal government will not decide until then which one it's going to go to as part of this $19 billion procurement process. And then they'll have to wait until 2025 until the plane is actually available for use by the Royal Canadian Air Force. So that means more than 15 years after this first process began, we will only see the first plane. John Paul Tasker, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, when you think of the moon landing, butter might not be the first thing to come to mind. But a pair in Ohio has found a novel way to combine the two. We'll take you there next.
Well, you'd think firefighters would be partial to rain, right, weatherman Brett? Yeah, <laughs> Given their line of work. But at one Vancouver Island fire hall, the sunnier, the better. So this is what a system of 360 solar panels looks like. The solar power project at Central Saanich Fire Hall 1 is the largest on the island. It's welcomed 360 new solar panels in an effort to be more sustainable. The system will produce so much energy, there will be enough for the station and the surrounding homes and businesses. Very cool. Yeah, that is pretty neat. I always like to see those projects going on. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, I think you've heard the expression before, the moon is made out of cheese. Yeah, well, not really. When it comes to the moon landing, <laughs> a sculptor in Ohio had a different dairy product in mind. Yes, this display at the Ohio State Fair celebrates the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. It's made of butter, completely <laughs> out of butter. Wow, they look mm, real. Get the popcorn. There's life-size <laughs> butter Neil Armstrong saluting an American flag, in addition to sculptures of Buzz, Buzz Aldrin rather, and Michael Collins. And not to be left out, of course, a butter cow and a butter calf as well. Must be quite the refrigeration system oh in there to keep that. I can't even imagine. <laughs> All right, that's it for tonight. Have a wonderful evening. Good night.